Ralph's first job as an army lieutenant in Vietnam was to build a road across a rice paddy. Progress was really slow because the paddy, the paddy just kept devouring most of the dirt that the soldiers laid down. One day, his superior officer, a major, showed up and began yelling, Who's in charge here? Who's in charge here? Everyone pointed to Lieutenant Ralph. The major marched up to Ralph. He started reprimanding him for how long it's been taking him to build this road through a rice paddy. This is important. You must get it done. He demanded Ralph would get the road done by the end of the week. Ralph said it's impossible and started to explain why it was impossible. And the major just wouldn't listen to Ralph. I don't need excuses. Get this done. He said, but I can't because. Of, and the major just said, you've got to get this. Let me show you something here. And Ralph said, let me show you. And he looked around, the major did, and he said, hey, sir, you get on that bulldozer. Start plowing through that rice paddy. Just go right on through there. Clear out a path, and then we can start throwing dirt down there. The man jumped up on that, that uh, um, bulldozer and started to scrape the muck off and to build the road, and instantly that bulldozer just sank. <laughs> the major turned to another soldier, looked around. Get on that bulldozer. Get in there and push that other bulldozer out. The soldier got on the bulldozer, went into the stuff, and just sank right back down. He looked around, saw another soldier, was about to tell him get on another bulldozer, but there wasn't another bulldozer. He looked around for any other equipment. There wasn't any other equipment. The major turned around, told his driver, get in the Jeep. The major got into the Jeep, turned around, looked back. Lieutenant! You're in charge. Get it done. <laughs> Who's in charge? <laughs> you know, it's funny how people attempt to be the person in charge until things go wrong. Then everybody wants to get out of the way. Nope, not me. I'm not the one in charge. In the past several months, we've gone through Jesus' last minute instructions to his disciples in the upper room. As found in John chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, last week was 17. They've gone out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and now they're, after their times of prayer, they're sleeping in the cases of the disciples. We find the arrest of Jesus in the Garden. Today I want to look at this arrest. I want us to see the answer to the question here. Who is in charge here? Who is in charge here? And I think there might be several people we might notice might be in charge, or maybe there's just one person in charge. But let's start with prayer and look at this passage. Lord, we are so thankful for your love. We're thankful for your blessings. Lord, there's no doubt in our mind who's in charge of our life. And it's not us. It's you. Help us always to surrender to you. Help us to realize that this world is in your hands, not ours. Help us to surrender always and trust you that you've got it under control. In Jesus' name, amen. Starting here in John chapter 18, verses, verses 1 through 3, it reads, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. In these first three verses, we see Judas brought soldiers. Judas brought soldiers. If you look at this, you would kind of look at it and say, Judas Iscariot was leading the soldiers. He led the soldiers to where Jesus was. He seems to be at this point in charge of the story. He's the one leading the soldiers. He's the one the people are following. And even though it looks like Judas Iscariot is in charge, let me have you think about something. How did Judas know where to go in the night to find Jesus? Who would set it up where Jesus was going to be? Jesus had. From the other Gospels, it's really obvious to see this because every day he would go into the city of Jerusalem, into the temple, he would talk with the people in the temple, and every night he would come back out to this garden, to the same spot, and he set up this precedence, he set up this 
pattern so that it would be very easy to find Jesus because every night he went out to the same exact spot in the garden so that there it would be very, very easily, readily found so that Judas would know exactly where to find him in the middle of the night. Jesus knew the Jews were seeking to kill him. He knew how Judas was setting it up and their betrayal and the arrest. He knew what was going on. And very early in the week, Jesus took control of the whole week. He set up a pattern to make it very easy for Judas Iscariot to come out in the dark, even though it was a full moon of the Passover time, to come out and find Jesus and the disciples. Jesus really is in control, even though it looks like Judas is the one leading the soldiers. But Jesus is the one who led Jesus, Judas out to where it was going to be. Even as Judas brought soldiers who came with lanterns and torches and weapons, the truth of the matter, Jesus was still in control. These soldiers felt like they were in control because they brought lanterns, they brought torches, they brought light so they could see what was going on, even though there was a full moon light because Passover was around full moon. They felt they were in control when they brought their weapons, military weapons, to encounter a man who had been, never been told about, never, uh, has, never do we read about Jesus carrying any weapon. So now they felt they were fully in control. And Judas Iscariot came out leading the soldiers, thought he was in charge. The soldiers came out with lanterns and torches and weapons, thinking they were in, in control. They all relied upon their own ideas and their strength. They felt they were in control because they were trusting in their ideas and their own strength, their own might, their strength found in their numbers. And by all earthly appearances, it did look like Judas Iscariot and the soldiers that he brought with them were in control. Yet all through the Old Testament, we can see similar situations where a huge army would come out against God's people. They believed they had everything in control. They were going to win by their sheer numbers, their brute strength, their cunning plans. And even in today's world, we have people who still believe they can outsmart God. They can pull one over on God, and God will never know. And even some Christians believe they, that God won't possibly know what's going on in the darkness of their house, in their closed-off areas, at their computers, at their work. They think they can outsmart God, and God will never know a thing. But does that really work not even close. We don't even have to go to the Old Testament examples for we have a situation right here that also proves we can never outsmart God. We can never outsmart Jesus. He knows. Let's continue reading in this story. Starting in verse 4 down to verse 9. So Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. And Judas also was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Therefore he again asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. And Jesus answered, I told you, I am he. So if you seek me, let these others go their way to fulfill the word which was spoke. Of those whom you have given to me, I lost not one. Right away here, verse 4, Jesus, John lets us know that Jesus went forth to Judas, to the soldiers. He went right out to them. Who's in charge? <laughs> Jesus. Even, Judas, even though Judas and the soldiers felt they were in charge under the cloak of their darkness, with all their well-armed soldiers, with their guide Judas Iscariot, Jesus knew all things even beforehand. He knew the plans of the religious leaders. He knew the plans of Judas. He knew his heart was full of greed. Judas, Jesus knew the timing of when they were coming. He knew their purpose for coming to the garden. He knew all things in regard to what was happening. Judas Iscariot, the Jews, the soldiers, all thought they were going to go out there and catch Jesus totally unaware. <laughs> we're going to surprise him. Surprise attack. But Jesus knew everything well in advance. There was no fooling him. They may have thought they had everything in their own control, but Jesus was in control of the entire situation. Don't ever think Jesus doesn't already know what's going on. We don't have to inform Jesus about what's happening in this world. What is happening in our lives? What sins we're already doing? He already knows, so feel, feel free to confess them to him. He already knows he's waiting for you to ask for forgiveness for your sins. And, and as Judas and the soldiers were nearing uh, the disciples, J John states for us that Jesus 
approached them. He went forth to them. To me, that's a small phrase, but it means an awful lot. Jesus was showing them and us that he was fully in control. Because most of us, if we saw a crowd coming at us, we'd turn around and go somewhere else. We'd hide. We'd go scatter. He didn't run and hide. He didn't change his plans of where he was going to spend that night so he, they wouldn't be able to find him. He didn't do any of the things that most people would have done if they would have known people were going to come and try to arrest us and beat us and, and, and crucify us. He stayed there, waited for them, and as they came, he approached them. He went to the soldiers. Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, he went forth and he said to them, who do you seek? He initiated the con conversation. He took full control of the situation. He was in charge. And when they, an when they answered and were seeking Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus immediately confessed who he is. I am he. At that, Judas Iscariot, even though he thought he was in charge with the soldiers, even though the soldiers thought they were in charge when they brought their lanterns and their weapons, Relying upon their own ideas and their strength, it tells us that they drew back and fell to the ground. Who's in control? Who's in charge? <laughs> These people are scared for their life. They weren't ready. They weren't used to confronting an enemy in, quote, unquote, a secret ambush attack. And then have the, the enemy come at them a full battle array saying, here I am. I mean, to them, everything in their military mind would have been saying, we've walked into a trap. We're in trouble. It's an ambush. Run. It always reminds me of that old joke about uh, this couple. They took their poodle to Africa. And they took their poodle to Africa. And, and, and while it was out there, the poodle kind of wandered off in the brush and got separated from the group. And there it was. And that, this poodle happened to look up. And he saw a leopard coming at him. And he knew this poodle was going like, uh, there's no way I can possibly win. What can I do? This, this, this leopard thinks I'm a delicious lunch. And, and looked around and saw some bones. And immediately the, this little poodle, by, his, by the way, its name was Cuddles. <laughs> Cuddles went running over to this bone and found this bone and started gnawing on the bone. And just as the leopard got close enough, about ready to pounce, the poodle said, man, that was one good leopard. I sure hope there's another one around here I can eat. The leopard crouched down and slunk off. It thought it escaped a close one. Well, there was a monkey watching the whole thing. And the monkey thought, this is terrible, pulling over a good one on the leopard. And you know what? I could win points with that leopard if I go and tell that leopard how he got tricked. So he chased off through the, the trees and found that leopard a further off. And, and he started talking to him. I, I hate to tell you, but that poodle over there just made a fool out of you. It wasn't a, eating a leopard. It just found a bone and started chewing on it. And, and it's really scared to death of you. And the leopard goes, thanks for telling me. I'll owe you one. I'm going to go get that poodle. And he turned around and started heading back there. And just as Cuddles saw the leopard coming back the second time, Cuddles didn't know where to go, still hadn't found them, everybody else. And finally, he just, Cuddles just sat back down and said, where's that monkey? I should never have trusted him. I sent him off an hour ago to find me another leopard, and he's still not back. <laughs> <laughs> You know, ambushes, <laughs> surprise attacks and traps are what these soldiers probably felt like they'd walked into. They came thinking Judas was leading them in for a surprise attack, and immediately here's Jesus walking straight to them, saying, who are you looking for? Jesus Nazareth. That's me. <laughs> oh boy, what did we walk into? Where are the rest of the disciples? What are we going to happen here? And it tells us they fell back. It's obvious to me Jesus was in control. They knew Jesus had full knowledge of what was going on. They saw that Jesus approached them. He wasn't running off. He actually admitted and confessed he was the one they were seeking. They realized who was in charge. And to show us further that Jesus was in charge, John records for us verses 7 through 9. Therefore, Jesus again asked them, Whom do you seek? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus said, I told you that I am he. Now pay attention to this next part. So if you seek me, 
Let these go their way to fulfill the word which he spoke. Of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. Notice how Jesus is again confronting them. And not only confronting them, he's actually giving them orders. Let these people go. You know, that would have been something to see in real life. Rough, powerful, well-armed soldiers falling back in fear from a man who simply says, I am he. I am the one you're looking for. And then to see these well-armed soldiers listen to and take orders from the guy they were sent to go arrest, to let these people go. I mean, in today's world, most bullies would have been saying to someone like Jesus, make me. <laughs> Who's going to make me? You and what army? These soldiers recognized the authority and the power of Jesus. Jesus was the one who was really in charge here in the garden. And Judas thought he was in charge as he led soldiers. The soldiers thought they were in charge as they brought torches and lanterns and weapons, relying upon their own ideas, their training, their strength, their numbers. They were going like, we got this. We can handle this. They came out expecting to find Jesus and his disciples sound asleep. Instead, they found Jesus fully awake and coming at them. The other disciples were awake too because Jesus has awake, awoken them. The whole element of surprise was gone. And all they could wonder at this time when they see Jesus saying, I'm he, and they fall back is they're thinking, did we walk into an ambush? Oh, no. But you know what? That didn't stop Peter. Verses 10 and 11, we think we see that Simon Peter attacked the army that came out. John writes, Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Here Peter decided, You know what? Maybe I better take charge. And he attempted to take the battle into his own hands, grabbing his sword, getting ready to fight, and he cut off the right ear of Malchus. And I hope that the aspect of cutting his right ear off shows us that he was aiming for the head and Malchus moved, and not that Peter actually thought, you know, if I cut off somebody's ear, this is going to end the whole battle. <laughs> I mean, that does not end the battle very well. But Peter attempted to take the battle into his own hands. And in the upper room, Jesus had asked his disciples to carry a sword. It's Peter. Peter's the only one who responds in that upper room, said, here's a sword. And Jesus said, that's enough. Now, just a few hours later, Peter, Peter is seeing a group of well-armed soldiers coming out to arrest Jesus. And Peter probably figured out, you know what? I'm the only one who had a sword. I'm the best possible defense here. I'm the only protection Jesus has. And Peter is ready to take the only sword they had, take it out into their midst, and he goes into battle ready to slay the enemy or go down trying. He's already told Jesus and he told the others, now, even if everybody else denies you, I will never deny you. In fact, I'll lay down my life for you. Here Peter was showing it. He pulled out his sword and he was putting his bragging where he was really doing it. He was going to do it. And the odds looked absolutely impossible. But Peter was ready to take charge and to use his sword and take the fight to the death. What happened next, though, put Peter and the others in a huge tailspin of confusion. John writes, Peter ordered, or Jesus ordered Peter, put your sword back in the sheath. Then he told Peter, I'm about to drink the cup that the Father has given me. The other gospel writers tell us that Jesus then went over and healed Malchus. And Jesus corrected Peter's vain attempt to be in charge. Every time I put myself in the shoes of anyone who was there, other than Jesus, to me this whole thing is absolutely mind-boggling. Your enemy has come out with swords and torches to arrest you and kill you. Your friends are fighting to defend you. And you stop your friends and you heal your enemies and rebuke your friend. I don't care who you are in this event. A soldier, Judas Iscariot, Peter, John, Matthew, James, one of the other disciples. If you had been there and you saw this, I think you would have been totally stunned. What? 
what just happened? What kind of man is this that won't let his friends defend him? And now is helping his enemy, healing the ear, the, uh, 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 Malchus, showing his enemies love and compassion, even stepping in saying, hey, arrest me. I've got to drink this cup. Even more confusing, especially in light of today's mob scenes, where does Jesus get the power and authority to stop the very start of a mob riot? I mean, you see those riots. You see how they escalate instantly. And just as the violence begins, all of a sudden Jesus stops it. And it seems like he's even on the enemy's side. This is an absolute amazing demonstration of the power and the authority of Jesus that he showed us he was truly in charge for the entire event that was unfolding there in the garden. He was in charge of Judas, even ha having commanded him to go out early and make sure you do this thing. Do it tonight. Do it quickly. He knew what was going on. He was the one who had set it all up by going out to the same place every night so that when Judas would go out and get the soldiers, they could come find him in the middle of the night in a garden out of town. He, Jesus was in charge of the soldiers who came out. He knew their very plan. He, he knew what was going to happen. He was even willing to help it get carried out, even going right to them and keeping them away from the other disciples even in charge of the disciples, able to stop the impetuous Peter from hurting anyone else and stopping the rest of the disciples from joining in with Peter, even in charge of Malchus's body, able to heal him. Which on a side note, the very first time I ever saw the movie Jesus, which comes directly from the Gospel of Luke, I remember watching that. They showed him cutting off that ear and Jesus reaches out his hand and heals him. Didn't pick up the earpiece, just healed him. I was going like, oh, they got that wrong. He was supposed to pick up that earpiece and put it back on. It is not in there that, that he had to pick it up. He just healed him. That's amazing, impressive power. No wonder Jesus had said very early, and the scriptures tell us very clearly, no one is taking my life from me. I lay it down. Greater love is no one than this, that he lays down his, his life for his friends. Jesus even told his disciples that all of this was very important for Jesus, needing to drink the cup of the Father, that the Father was giving to him. Because what was happening was Jesus, even though he's in charge, he was letting the Father lead. Jesus was in control of everyone and everything around him to let the Father lead, even leading Jesus to the cross to die for our sins. A person could argue, argue justly even, that therefore it was the Father who was ultimately charged, and that is correct. Yet it also shows us what obedience to the Father really means. As Jesus took charge of the event to make certain that everything was done according to the plan and the authority and the prophecy from the Father. And we need to live in the same way. We live in a world where there's all kinds of forces at work trying to be in charge. Many of us still have bosses who are in charge of our work. And we have a government that attempts to be in charge of our lives, even commanding us with mandates and edicts to social distance, wear your mask, uh, drive the speed limit, pay your taxes. I mean, you look at all the things they tell us to do. We even find people who want to strike out and attack and riot and be a Simon Peter, striking against the established forces around us. But can we follow in the footsteps of Jesus? Can we live our lives to fulfill God's word daily? That we walk righteously no matter what happens around us. Can we live letting Jesus be in charge of every part of us, humbly submitting to him as he calls us and not rebelling against those around us? That's amazing what Jesus did. We know that Jesus didn't want to submit to the arrest, trials, and the cross. How do we know that? What's it say in the other Gospels? What did he pray while in the garden? Father, if possible, remove this cup from me. Yet nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He didn't want to submit to it. But he didn't rebel. He followed what the Father told him to do. Living with Jesus in charge, living to let God's will be done is not always easy. It's not always what you want. 
but it is the right thing to do. Will you let Jesus be in charge of your life? Will you be obedient to all that he calls you to do? Will you make certain Jesus is in charge of your life? Lord, I am so thankful that we look at this passage. We see how great you are. We sang about your greatness in songs like Majesty and other ones. And all hail the power of Jesus' name. We wanted to lift you up and exalt you. Lord, we just ask that, you, that these songs are not just words but they are expressions from our heart that we want to put you above all and exalt you, living as you called us to do. Lord, help us to think about that as we sing this invitation. Help us, Lord, to make a decision to live for you in Jesus' name. Amen.